Don, why is there another improper rentals video? Aren't we done? Well, no. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in order to prime us to get ready to talk about uh, infinite series, okay, in chapters five and six, okay, we need to talk about this notion of comparison. And in particular, we're going to talk about this so called comparison theorem, which allows us to estimate integrals and determine if certain improper integrals converge or diverge. That may not make sense right now, but don't worry. We'll make this a little easy, okay? Uh, just try to follow along with some of the basic estimates, okay? And we'll go and see how we can estimate integrals by using the comparison theorem. So I want to go ahead and put this back in full screen so you don't have the weird black bar there. There we go. Uh, I want to go ahead and first explain what this comparison theorem is, okay? So this is sort of like your primer to what would you'd see in, like, say, uh, foundations of analysis and the real real analysis one course uh, if you're a math major or a math minor um but let's uh think about this picture so suppose i have uh two functions f of x and g of x and i can order them i can say that f is smaller than or equal to g on some interval so say on the interval from a to infinity okay now what does that really mean um, let's put this, let's make this make a little more sense here. I'll change G to this dark blue here. Magic, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go ahead and draw a picture here. And let's say that, uh, I have a function F, maybe, and a function G, okay, that, you know, bounds it in some way. And the question is, okay. Can we compare the integrals, okay? So can I compare these integrals here? So can I compare the integrals of f and g over these sets? And the answer is yes, I can in some sense, okay? So we're going to have to go first talk about some uh, elementary inequalities here, some estimates that we're going to need, okay? So I'm just going to go ahead and call these uh, facts. I won't prove them. Okay, we're just going to take them at face value. Okay. So fact one, okay, uh, if you kind of remember from calculus one, we had the nice basic limit sine x over x and its cosine cousin and tangent cousin. Um, I'm only going to tackle sine and cosine for now. Okay. For all real x, okay, if you remember, sine of x is bounded. OK, meaning uh, the graph of the sine curve is trapped between one and negative one in absolute value. OK, so we have this and, of course, the same for cosine. OK, for all X. OK, what that means is the graph of the sine and cosine is trapped between minus one and one. OK, uh, recall. OK, let's do a quick recall here for absolute value. If absolute value of X is less than or equal to K. That means that x lies between k and negative k. Okay, think about what absolute value means, right? Distance from zero, okay? So this is our first fact, okay? Uh, the second fact that we'll use is about e to the x, okay? And e to the x is always positive. And that was weird. Uh, what just happened here? Okay. Oh, well, well, we'll run with it. Okay. I'm keeping this in. All right. Uh, so the next fact here is that e to the x is always positive. Okay. e to the x is always positive. Okay. For all x. Okay. Think about the picture. Okay. Uh, next fact, which we'll use here. Okay. Uh, this is this reciprocal property. Okay. If a and b can be ordered like this, and both are positive. So if A is smaller than B, then when I take reciprocals, okay, I reverse the order of the inequality. So one over A, the reciprocal of A is actually bigger than one over B, all right? So reciprocals reverse the order of inequalities, okay? So, we have that, and here is the last one that we're, I'll mention here, and 
it's a little funky, all right, before I actually state what the actual comparison theorem is, okay? This is a little bit of a funky result here, okay? So if A and B are positive, okay, then, okay, this one can kind of follow from the above, okay? 1 over A plus B compared to 1 over A, okay? 1 over A plus B is smaller than 1 over A, okay? What this means is, okay, with reciprocals, I have this inverse relationship. If I make the denominator smaller, I make the fraction bigger. Okay, think about that. If I make the denominator smaller, I make the fraction bigger. Think about going from uh, eighths to quarters to halves, right? So, okay, you're getting bigger slices of the pizza, okay? So we're going to use these facts in one way or another. And what's the main result that we're going that we have here? Okay. Well, here's a the comparison theorem. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a pretty powerful theorem for us. It just allows us to estimate what an integral is if we can, or we can make some conclusions about the estimates. So let's suppose, okay, that the functions f and g follow this ordering. So f is smaller than or equal to g on some interval. Okay. Could be even a finite interval, but let's consider the infinite case here. Okay. So now we have two things here, okay? The first statement is, okay, if, okay, the integral of g is convergent, then so is the integral, whoops, so is the integral of f. If the bigger one converges, then the smaller one converges, okay? If the bigger integral converges, the smaller integral converges. We're going to see this again when we talk about infinite series, okay, with that comparison test. This is a continuous version of that theorem, okay? Uh, the second result, okay, is, in a sense, equivalent, in a sense. Um, if, instead, the smaller one diverges... then so does the bigger. Apologies for my terrible handwriting. Okay. If the smaller one diverges, the bigger one diverges. If the bigger one converges, the smaller one converges. Okay. Now, this follows, okay. These follow from the monotonicity of the integral. What that means is, okay, That means is, okay, if f is smaller than g, then the integral, okay, of f, the smaller one, okay, is smaller than the integral of the bigger one. Okay, so this just follows from the monotonicity of the integral, okay? If you have two functions and you can compare them, and you can kind of see it from the picture, right? Okay, g, the blue curve, is bigger. So it encompasses more area, okay? That's kind of the result that we're using here. Okay, so that was a lot of preamble, all right? Now we're going to go ahead and use this result here, okay? We're going to use the comparison theorem to determine whether these integrals converge or diverge. Okay, so this is where we have to, like, really think, okay? Uh, we can probably go for some, like, gut feelings, all right? Well, let's take a look at this first one, the integral from 2 to infinity, sorry, 1 to infinity, a 2 over x to the 4th plus 1 dx, okay? Now, how? What do I do? Well, it would be nice, right? Okay. If that 1 wasn't there, wouldn't it be really nice? Because I know how to do that. That's just power rule, right? You know, 2 times x to the minus 4, do some power rule nonsense, and you take a limit, and then, eh, okay. Well, I have a hunch that this thing converges, okay? We don't need to find the exact value of this integral. In fact, uh, well, we probably can't find it with the tools that we have now. Um, but I have a hunch that this thing converges, okay? Because if that 1 wasn't there, we'd be fine. But the thing is, how does that 1 affect the integrand, okay? So let's make an observation here, okay? 
x to the fourth plus one compared to x to the fourth. Okay. Well, if I make this thing, you know, if I drop the one, I'm making this thing smaller, right? If I subtract one, I make it smaller. So x to the fourth plus one is bigger. Okay. Now, what does that tell us? Well, by fact four here, okay, and really fact three, if I make the denominator of a fraction bigger, the entire fraction gets smaller, okay? So take a look here. X to the fourth, X to the fourth plus one. That's getting bigger. So when I take reciprocals, the order reverses. Now, so that's easy, okay? Now, of course, I can multiply by two, right? And then uh, the result holds, okay? So this is by three, uh, by four, actually. Okay, so now I have everything I need, okay? Because take a look here. So this integral, this unknown thing, okay? Because I can replace the denominator by something smaller, I'm making the fraction bigger. So this is less than or equal to the integral from one to infinity of two over x to the fourth dx, okay? And, well, this is an integral I know how to do. This is an antiderivative I know. Okay, so I can go ahead and take an antiderivative. And, by the way, I'm going to go ahead and be a little loose here. In parts one and two, we framed the improper integrals as limits. Okay, so here I take a limit as t goes to infinity. I'm not going to go ahead and write that down for the moment. Actually, you know what? I really should, okay? When you do this enough, you can kind of skirt, skirt that step. So, we have the limit as t goes to infinity of... Well, think about the antiderivative, okay? Two times x to the minus three over minus three. So I have negative two thirds, x to the minus three, okay, evaluated between uh, t and one. Okay, so we do the stuff, right? Okay, so we take this limit, and then what do we get here? We'll have negative two over three t cubed, and then minus minus is a plus, okay, plus two thirds. Well, as t goes to infinity, that first term there goes to zero. It zooms off to zero because the denominator wins, okay? It's bottom heavy. Remember that, right? So because that first limit, that first term goes to zero, okay, we get that this entire limit is two thirds. And so this integral by comparison is convergent, okay? So that's how we kind of manipulate this, right? Okay, I replaced the integrand with something bigger and I knew the behavior of that bigger thing. In that case, this integral, we know, okay, we get, this is kind of a fun fact here, we know that this unknown integral is at most, if its value is two thirds. I don't know what it is and frankly, I don't care. I just wanna see if it behaves well or not. So let's kind of take that idea with this next one here, okay? 2 to infinity, okay, x cubed over square root of x to the 7th minus 1. Well, I don't know how to integrate that. You don't need to know how to integrate the thing, right? We're trying to reduce this to a simpler problem, okay? So we're going to go ahead and uh, take this approach again, okay? So uh, I'm going to be a little loose with this here for the observation. But let's look at the denominator, right? Again, it would be nice if that 1 wasn't there. But instead, it's a minus one instead of a plus one, okay? So I'm making this denominator bigger, okay? And so that means if I make the denominator bigger, the fraction gets smaller, okay? Uh, but Sean, where's the square root? Well, we're just going to go ahead and take square roots, okay? Uh, we're far enough away from one because when you take the square root of a small, we need to have one over number between zero and one, it makes it bigger. Uh, you can kind of uh, play around with that. So uh, what we have here now is that one over the square root of x to the seventh minus one is indeed bigger than one over the square root of x to the seventh. Okay. And of course I can multiply by x cubed and I'll get some stuff. Okay. So uh, what do we do now? Well, I'm going to replace the unknown integral. Okay, so we have our unknown integral here. And I'm going to replace it by something uh, smaller. 
So the integral from 2 to infinity, all right? And you can be a little more clever with this if you want to. Uh, we're not going to go ahead and show those clever tricks here. Um, so we're going to replace it by the smaller thing. So x cubed over the square root of x to the seventh. Okay. Sean, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, you do. Remember, when I divide with exponents, I'm subtracting the powers, right? Okay. Note here that x to the seventh and the square root is the same as x to the minus 7 over 2, okay? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so by some exponent rules, okay, we have the following. Okay, we get x cubed times x to the minus 7 over 2 dx. Okay, combine the fractions. That's an x to the minus 1 half, okay? So let's write that down here. Um, okay. So 2 to infinity, x to the minus 1 half dx. Okay, and then, of course, we take an antiderivative, so we have, this is going to be 2 square root of x, okay, because x to the minus 1 half plus 1 is a positive 1 half, okay, double check this yourself. Okay, and I'm going to take limits here, okay, I'm just not going to write it down for the moment. Okay, but this goes to infinity. This diverges. Okay, so our lower one, the smaller one, diverges. And by comparison, the bigger one diverges, okay? The integral diverges. Okay. So I took my unknown integral. I compared it against something smaller whose behavior I knew, okay? And then I got something that diverged, so the bigger one has to diverge, okay? All right, let's look at this next one here. This one shouldn't be too bad. This one's actually nice, okay? Uh, integral of 1 to infinity of cosine squared of x minus, uh, sorry, over x squared dx. Now, uh, for those of you that will maybe be going on to some advanced mathematics and maybe even in electrical engineering, uh, integrals of this type show up a lot in signal processing. This is a variant of something called a Dirichlet integral. Uh, none of you, it's fine. Uh, so, uh, how do we handle this? So... Uh, we can use our elementary estimate here. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and take absolute values here because I have a cosine, okay? Cosine is bounded between minus 1 and 1, okay? So we're going to, here's our observation here, okay? The observation is that cosine square x over x square is less than or equal to, okay? Well, cosine is bounded by one in absolute value, so so too is cosine square, okay? So let's just kind of show what's going on here. I have cosine of x squared over x squared. Now, remember, absolute value makes things positive, okay? So I can drop the absolute values in the x square in the denominator. And then I have the fact here that since cosine square, since cosine, excuse me, is less than or equal to one in absolute value, I can replace the top by one. Okay, this is by fact one. Okay. Now I've replaced this integrand that I don't presently know how to deal with. Okay. I need some advanced tools for it. I've replaced this integrand by something bigger. And spoiler alert, this bigger thing will actually converge. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, look at the uh, uh, comparisons here. And in fact... Uh, what this also tells me here is that cosine square of x is less than or equal to 1. I could have used that right off the bat. I kind of like using the absolute values. It makes things a little prettier. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and look at this. So we have the integral from 1 to infinity of cosine square x over x square dx. By the above observations, okay, this is less than or equal to the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared dx. Hey, that's an integral I know how to do. That's a P integral, okay? So, minus 1 over X, okay? Just power rule again. Infinity to 1. And we think about the limit, right? Let's write this step down, okay? Uh, when I plug in T at the top, I get minus 1 over T, and then it's plus 1. But the first term goes to 0, okay? That's one of our basic limits here. That goes to 0. It's bottom heavy, okay? And this limit is 1. And because I've now bounded my unknown integral by a constant, by something that converges, okay, 
I know for a fact that this integral is convergent. Now, for those of you that want to uh, try to figure out what the, uh, wow, I can't write. Uh, for those of you that want to figure out what the actual value is, I think it's, I think it's pi over two. I'm not entirely sure. I can't quite remember. Or one minus pi over two. Something like that. The integral is convergent. Okay, there we go. All right, so you might be seeing this, and I encourage you to look at the examples in the text, right? Uh, lots of other examples out there on the internet, okay? Um, on your favorite uh, social media shorts, reels, platform, or whatever. You can probably find it. Uh, let's look at this last one here, okay? 3 plus e to the minus x over x. Well, okay. I don't pro really have much to work on, but I have a feeling this thing's going to diverge. Sean, how can you see that? Well, I have my ways. Remember what I said uh, towards the end of part two, right? If one of the integrals fails to converge, the entire thing is divergent. I already see a divergent integral here. See if you can spot it, okay? Let's go through and use a comparison theorem here, okay? What's the observation here? Well, I have e to the minus x plus three, okay? Well, at worst, okay, I know that e to the minus x is always positive, Sean, you said e to the x was always positive. Yeah, I know. But it's for all x. That includes the negative ones as well. <laughs> so, what that means is I know that at worst, okay, this is going to be greater than 3, okay? e to the minus x plus 3 is always going to be greater than 3. Okay, that e to the minus x term, okay, if x is super large, be close to zero, but it's still going to be bigger than three. You see where I'm going with this? I'm going to replace this thing with something smaller that I know is badly behaved. Okay. So check this out. We replace our integrand with something smaller. Okay. Three over X. Okay. I've just replaced the numerator. Okay. The numerator still retains the behavior of the entire fraction, but the denominator kind of reverses, okay? Remember, make the denominator smaller, the fraction gets bigger. But if you make the numerator bigger, the fraction gets bigger, okay? So I have this, and alarm bells should be going off here, okay? The antiderivative here, 3 log x from infinity to 1. Well, think about this limit, right? The limit as t goes to infinity of 3 log of absolute t minus, well, log of 1 is 0. What happens here? Remember that log grows slowly. This limit is infinity. Because the smaller one diverged, the bigger one diverges. So the entire integral diverges. Okay, this one you de you probably could have seen uh, the trick here to show that the integral is divergent. Um, but if you use a comparison theorem here, you see that the integral diverges because I am bounded from below by something that's badly behaved, by something that's divergent. So what has this shown you? Okay, this shows you that some of these integrals that you may see in applications, maybe in physics and engineering, okay, Maybe you can't actually evaluate them. You can get some numerical estimates, okay? But you can't actually evaluate them if they're like, say, minus infinity to infinity or like two or through an asymptote. You got to be a little careful there, okay? And this is how we showed to use this comparison test to get an idea on the behavior of the integral. And this is the same reasoning that we'll do when we talk about infinite series later on, okay? Well, that's the end of chapter three, okay? We have our integration techniques, our most basic ones, okay? And now we know how to handle improper integrals. Okay, get ready to use all these tools in tandem somehow, okay? I'll see you in the next one.